I'm Lisa Thompson. I work at the African Centre for Citizenship and Democracy at the School of Government, University of the Western Cape. My background is in international political economy and uh, I've latterly been involved in development projects both more macroeconomic as well as more micro field study, uh, case study work. So as part of a 10-year collaborative research uh, project with the University of Sussex uh, Institute for Development Studies. We did a series of uh, engagements on participatory development. So that's my background also in linking the global to the local and looking at the actual development content of uh, macroeconomic policy and particularly at the level of international development pronouncements which is why I'm interested in BRICS and also interested in FOCAC. I think the OECD DAC model uh, compared to the Chinese model are two very different models and in fact one of the criticisms is that uh, the Chinese model is in fact not development aid because it has a completely different structure to the OECD DAC model. So um, it's been questioned as to whether we can consider the type of loans and uh, kind of interest for infrastructural support that China provides as development um, the same kind of development aid. The question in terms of how it is being uh, portrayed in the media, and I think that's the interest of this conference, uh, of this symposium, and also of the work that we're doing, is how does the narrative actually, the, the, the narrative both in terms of development as well as how it's portrayed in the media, translate into concrete forms of uh, inclusive collective development as is being currently uh, punted by the uh, by the FOCAC uh, um, um, platform. So the platform there is which obviously is being um, very much uh, influenced by the pronouncements of Xi Jinping is to say that th this type of assistance is assistance that comes with uh, no strings attached, so that's one of the quotes. No strings attached, uh, no political um, conditionalities, no economic conditionalities. That's the big difference between the two types of uh, uh, aid. But then one has to, as I was saying in the presentation today, one has to look at what the realities are of that type of aid. So most of it is infrastructural uh, investment concessional loans um, and then along with that comes uh, other forms of aid for larger uh, developmental initiatives particularly special economic zones that are linked through for example the railway lines that are being provided as part of Belt and Road and these concessional loans will have to be paid back so uh, in terms of the question of lack of conditionality one has to bear in mind that there are still strings attached it's not just uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, it's just not money being dished out uh, benevolently and altruistically, that money does have to be repaid and if one looks at the enormous amount of uh, capital that's injected into, for example, the railway initiatives, uh, I gave the example in the talk today of the Addis Ababa Djibouti railway line which cost four million dollars, um, that was a quarter of Ethiopia's total budget uh, for that year. The cost of that uh, in the long term in terms of repayment against other types of infrastructural investment that the Ethiopian government will be able to then uh, uh, roll out are going to be severely limited. So when one looks at it um, objectively there is another side to this uh, no strings attached aid. Uh, it may be no strings attached in terms of the political conditionalities that OECD and DAC had in place, but again, uh, I think one has to bear in mind that when China says no strings attached, there's also a dimension of political accountability and responsibility, um, oversight of these loans that needs to be taken into account. If we look at our South African example, some of the loans that have come 
from the Chinese government through, for example, Transnet. Uh, in between 2013 and 2015, there were loans made to Transnet uh, for, again, also for investment in railway lines. 500 million of that landed up uh, being uh, disappeared into the back pockets of various Transnet officials. So I think, um, and Brian Malefi was fired as a result of that. So I think one needs to take into account that this is a, a much more complex picture. And when we're looking at the two types of aid, um, we need to think a little bit also about the long-term consequences of this kind of borrowing for the African population, for the South African population, for the developmental content that it's supposed to have uh, built into it. I think that's quite questionable. Currently, the, the celebratory moment that we're seeing portrayed in the press and uh, through the pronouncements of President Ramaphosa uh, show that there is a tendency to want to assume the face value statements of, for example, President Xi Jinping. So no strings attached, there's a, a, a rather simplistic understanding of what that really entails. and. Um, just repeating the point of that there's no such thing as a free lunch, there are always strings attached. So there will come that moment where there will be consequences for the kind of exercise of soft power that's happening through these economic concessions, through this type of aid and trade. And I don't think that the South African government are taking enough cognizance of that. Uh, to, to borrow from an expression used by uh, an online journalist that I recently uh, watched doing a critique of this type of aid. It seems that and not just South African government, but African governments in, in, in general tend to think uh, this is all a question of just, you know, aid as a form of rolling over and having your tummy tickled. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's soft, it's good, uh, there are going to be no consequences. And unfortunately, I think there's not enough uh, uh, careful deliberation about on what conditions these loans are accepted. Uh, so to what extent did that loan have, um, or that investment have conditionalities built in in terms of the types of uh, local procurement, in terms of local job creation, and they are not just referring to the job creation around uh, creating a top structure, so not just uh, in for, uh, 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 um, jobs that are uh, short term, um, jobs that are, are more um, professionalized, that are more long term, um, that tend to really boost the local uh, revenue and local development uh, dimension of, of these projects. I don't think that there's enough attention to that. Uh, certainly in terms of what, when we look at the figures of the employment uh, statistics coming out of that type of investment, we're not seeing enough kickbacks for the local economies and for the local populations, the local communities. When we look at the digital media, uh, certainly the influence of the independent media group, which is uh, um, owned and run by Iqbal Survey, who also happens to be the chair of the BRICS Business Council, uh, there we're seeing a very uncritical, uh, very celebratory uh, moment in the following of what uh, has taken place over the last six months with regard to uh, BRICS investment and FOCAC investment. I don't think that that is, uh, it's definitely not representative of the, the entire uh, BRICS, uh, uh, South African social media coverage of BRICS and of FOCAC. And I'd like to single out in particular the Daily Maverick, who are an online platform that have been doing a lot of um, more critical coverage, um, and Mail and Guardian as well. And there are some others, Pamazuka um, just brings to mind, um, and then um, not in South Africa, Counterpunch in the US that have provided a lot more critical analysis of what is going on. Um, but I think we uh, just need to think a little bit about, um, in terms of um, a Belt and Road, why is there such a celebratory moment from the online media platform IOL? And I think that has got a lot to do with how much um, involvement Iqbal himself has with uh, BRICS and with um, generally with, with with government. So I think the, the, uh, that interface is, a, is an uncomfortably close one. There's definitely been some signs of 
um, control of what comes out in terms of pronouncements around BRICS. Um, there's also been, um, we see this also in terms of uh, um, the critique of those who dare to say uh, or comment against what has been pronounced as a all win-win, mutual benefit. Uh, it seemed to be a, a, being a bit uh, subversive, negative to say anything which is, is, is critical. And, and I think that's um, rather problematic because we do need to be critical, critical. We need to be thinking carefully through what the implications of this are for the long-term development trajectory of both South Africa and Africa. And particularly as South Africa slips into recession, we need to think about the consequences of these forms of economic investment and development uh, as it is, is, is uh, um, purported to be. I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of the developmental component happening in areas like uh, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay, where Kucha, the success story of the SEZs, is uh, supposed to be boosting um, economic development. So we, 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 if we look at that, we need to think about what is the long-term consequences of, of this type of uh, investment, and Belt and Road in particular as part of that, who, are, who is going to benefit uh, uh, from this type of investment. And, and, it, and it's very clear that over the short term and medium term that China stands to benefit the most and we need to be cognizant of that and we need to be watchdogging that and there the media and the online media plays a very very vital role.